Welcome class to Digestive System Part 2. I uh, talked to my cat and he agreed not to uh, not to uh, interrupt me today. We'll see how that goes. Um, your teeth, great, great, great. Interesting, interesting subject. These are the hardest part of your body. They're made with a, a crystalline substance. I mean, it's only a couple percent organic matter. The rest of it's all just solid. Uh, crystalline with calcium and phosphorus. So that'll last a long time. <clears throat> you may, the rest of your bones may be degraded and broken up, but your teeth will hang out the longest. In fact, a lot of uh, uh, our extinct uh, animals, you look at uh, giant ground sloths and bison and uh, even rhinos and cheetahs that were running around. Um, we know them from, described from a single tooth. You're probably saying to yourself, well, how do we know about the whole animal from a tooth? Well, if you study living animals, and, uh, and fossils, you can put it together. And so the teeth will last the longest because they're the hardest part of your body. Here's my teeth. Here's a panoramic view. And you all have read these before. You've seen them before. Where you have this uh, very bright white is <clears throat> the densest material. So those would be uh, cavities or a crown on there. Look at that. And then you can see where I had a tooth there, my uh, second molar uh, had to be extracted, pulled out, cracked. And you can see the bone underneath it, you can tell where the root was. It's got a, a little different density to it. So that was a hole, a gaping socket that uh, filled up with bone over the months. And now you can see it still hasn't completely remodeled. And since then they've drilled a hole, put a, um, uh, put a screw in there and they put a, uh, an implant on there. But, uh, yeah. Very interesting. You can see in the middle, kind of this uh, dark area is the pulp cavity. You can see those are roots, how deep they go into the bone, both your mandible and your maxilla. So we uh, mammals have really good teeth uh, and different teeth. It's called heterodont. We have different teeth. Only mammals, um, sharks and alligators, they're all teeth are all pointy and kind of pretty much the same. Uh, but we have molars and incisors and canines. We really have different functions to break up our food. And being mammals, we chew the hell out of our food. So we get it in really small pieces so that lots of surface area so we can completely get all those calories because <clears throat> we're really costly with our high body temperature and metabolism. When we discuss our teeth, your upper teeth are your maxillary teeth, your maxilla. And then all your lower teeth are your mandibular teeth, because this bone is your mandible. Yeah. And they fit together or occlude uh, just right. And uh, the joint here that we studied was the TMJ. Remember, you can have a lot of problems with that. Your temporal mandibular joint uh, allows you to not only be a hinge, but we can move our teeth side to side, even protrude and retract our jaw as well. Not like a cow or a giraffe or something that seriously, but we can we have that kind of movement in order to to grind the food on our teeth, and it can cause a lot of issues too because uh, a lot of pressure can be on that joint. It's a little pad of cartilage that can get worn out in there too. So we have two sets of teeth. Kind of cool. Um, sharks will continuously make teeth, right? Um, but we have two sets. That's it. <clears throat> If you lose an adult tooth, you don't grow any more back. And it's one of my million dollar ideas too, is uh, uh, having the ability to grow teeth back, you know, after that second set. Imagine losing a tooth, instead of an implant, we could put in some stem cells and have a new molar grow. So I haven't heard much talk about that, but that would be amazing if we could do that. You could just eat whatever you want and then just get a, change your teeth like you change your oil, just get new teeth. Um, and then enamel, that, the white out there, once that wears out, you can't make any more. That's made by a membrane that's on top of the tooth before it erupts. Once it erupts out of the gum, that enamel producing membrane is gone. And so, you know, all the acid, all the grinding you do in your enamel, it's permanent. You know, there's no, you can't make any more. All right, but back to a number of teeth. So it's, they're called deciduous, like a, uh, unlike a pine tree, an oak or a maple is deciduous. It means it loses its leaves and it grows them back. So we have two sets. And our baby teeth, uh, you can see we have 20. And uh, <clears throat> they come in, uh, after like six months or so, a little baby, the first little tooth will come out. 
And uh, you can see at Baby Teeth, we have the incisors up front. We have the canines, just like you guys have, and a couple molars, two molars. So what are we missing? We're missing two premolars and a molar. Um, yeah, let's click over to the adult teeth over here. And you can see with those, um, you have these two premolars. They're also called bicuspids. Um, and then we have this, this third molar as well. Third molar is also called your wisdom teeth. And they can cause all kinds of problems. They can come in backwards, sideways. They may not cause you any problems, but I, I don't have any because they all got pulled out because they were going to cause issues. And overall, kind of idea is that um, our jaws are pretty small evolutionarily compared to our ancestors. We have bigger, more massive jaws. And so there seems to be not room for that, that last molar to cause so many problems in so many people. And you can see the different kinds of teeth. You can see the incisors up front, you know, beautiful for uh, nipping off a, a carrot or a bud or a shoot or a, uh, taking a bite out of an apple. And then our canines are not that impressive compared to, you know, a dog or a cat or something like that. But, you know, we got some canines uh, puncture our prey. And then the, the premolars and molars, you can see they have that flat top with the cusps on them. Really good for grinding, grinding, often plant material. Uh, uh, remember, your tongue and your buccinator will keep moving the, the food so it's over the surface of the molars like that. All right, well, let's talk more about teeth. Well, I'm back. I <clears throat> shut the shade there. It's getting a little bright. We are Saturday late afternoon kind of thing. That's where I'm at. I don't know when you're listening to me. Um, so these teeth, I'll talk more about uh, how you specifically name them. Uh, I won't ask you eruption dates uh, specifically because who memorizes all that unless you're really into teeth. But uh, the first teeth that come in, a little baby, are these much smaller incisor, so, yeah, six months. And the top ones a couple months later so you know a little tiny baby usually it's one of these teeth much of the chagrin of a nursing mother the one little sharp tooth coming out right there and uh, looking through you can see looking at uh, um, the eruption of these uh, baby teeth you can see up to uh, the last molar comes in when you're over two years old and so you get these baby teeth um, do you worry about cavities in the baby teeth I am supposed to say yes, but you're going to lose them, all right? You got adult teeth underneath them ready to come out. So these baby teeth are temporarily, but you can see, they. how long do they last? Well, um, look at the adult teeth coming when you're six, seven years old, your first ones. And you can see they kind of erupt in the same order that the baby teeth. So baby teeth came out first, and then uh, it's going to be the first to be lost and replaced. So it's kind of a, on a schedule like that. Yeah, and then looking at wisdom teeth, that's even, I think it's a little young, this range. <clears throat> so some of you don't, have, your wisdom teeth aren't even in yet, <laughs> if they're going to erupt at all. So you can see you're 21 or 25 years old before those last ones come in. Yeah, so these uh, eruption dates, interesting, but you know, I'm not going to ask you, you know, how many months when does the canine come in? You know, well, too much. So your teeth, if you're really, really good, you're a hygienist or a dentist, you number these suckers. You know, oh, number 14, uh, number 28, right? And um, the number of teeth, remember you have 20 as a baby, and then as an adult, let's take a look. You're gonna have eight per quadrant, right? If we look at, all right? You're gonna have, we call this the central incisor, lateral incisor, canine, some people it's pointy and you got two bicuspids or premolars premolar one and two and then three molars so if you add those up it'd be one two three four five six seven eight so eight in a quadrant so all of my upper teeth would be 16 because they're the same and there's gonna be 16 on the bottom so 32 adult teeth and if you don't have your wisdom teeth how many teeth do you have 28 I see that, did that in my head. Um, 28, for a lot of you, have, I have 28 teeth. Um, yeah, look at the look at the shape of the anatomy, fascinating. You can see canines, obviously, they can be pointy. Used not only for food procurement, if you're a cat, you know, use it to, saber-toothed cat, think about that, looking at that. Um, um, 
the kill and the and the prey. Uh, and these sizers are are very uh, like a like a shovel, like a, a spade. So they're going to really bite into that apple. And then looking at these uh, molars and premolars, big flat surfaces with bumps on them that are going to allow you to to grind that food like that. Yeah. And so you need to all be able to tell me. Um, I'll ask in the practical every specific tooth. It's simply going to be this. You have right or left. I think you guys got that. And then the upper teeth are your maxillary, the lower your mandibular. So this one right here is going to be your right maxillary central incisor. This one right here. That's going to be your left mandibular canine. So just practice. And so you can name them all. Again, you don't have to do numbers. You may hear your dentist say things like, oh, the, the buccal side of number 14 has a, has a cavity, something like that. And we can also talk about the lingual would be the tongue side, the lingual tongue side. And then uh, and the buccal towards buccinator, towards the outside. So they can do that. And uh, I remember my dentist, they were going through and they would do number 15, RBC. I'm like, RBC and red blood cell. So it turns out they don't want to say blood because it kind of freaks out the patient. So let's say RBC. But I figured it out though. Right. Look at this chill child skull. It's terrible. Something from a, a horror movie. But so cool. So the adult teeth develop long before they erupt. And so the baby teeth come out and the young, they start as little tooth buds deep to them and they'll keep growing. And then the baby teeth, uh, their roots get reabsorbed, they get loose, you know, the tooth gets loose. And then uh, the adult tooth behind it's gonna kind of push forward some more and that tooth will fall out and that adult tooth will erupt right behind it. And that's it, you know, you don't have like a third or a fourth, you only have two, two versions. So look at this, just so cool. I guess, looking here, looks like the incisors here that this is a child that's, that's starting to get the adult tooth, teeth looks like that. And then just look how impressive these, Canines have the deepest roots, really. Look at that right there. Look at the canines. You're seeing that um, uh, one beneath it erupting, and you can just, you know, how, how, how impressive. It's up in the bone. It's going to come out and uh, replace those, those baby teeth. So very, very cool. And that's one way we uh, age skeletons is by looking at the teeth. We know if it's an adolescent or an adult, as long as looking for those as well as looking for those epiphyseal plates, whether they're fused or not, because you know, at the ends of your long bones, they fuse. Another thing is you can look at the teeth and say, oh, this is a child or an adult. All right, some basic tooth anatomy. And some of this, you like parmaline? I got this, right? For instance, I'm pretty sure you know, this is the crown of the tooth, this is the white part that comes above the gum. And then the roots, you have the roots of the teeth that go deep within the sockets in the bone. And we will see that there's, they're not cemented in um, to the bone. They're not extensions of the bone. They're their own separate little organs that are in these bony sockets. But then there's this collagen kind of ligament that allows the teeth to move a little bit, just a little bit, right? They're, they're, they feel pretty solid, but they can move around. Um, that's preferable because you take a real hard bite and you don't, you don't want the tooth to just crack. It has a little bit of give that'll help. And it gives your feedback too. As you chew on some granola or, you know, you feel your tooth, you can feel your teeth moving. The nerves are, are telling you what's going on in there too. So um, you don't want the teeth just an extension of the bone. It would be too, it'd be brittle and you wouldn't have much feedback, but they're, they're tethered in there by collagen ligaments. Yeah. What else can we look at this? I mean, we're looking at the roots. I think y'all know the root canal is going to be a, a canal that's going to allow the, uh, the, the nerves and blood vessels to come up into the pulp of the tooth. And so the tooth pulp is the middle, it's filled with blood, nerves, lymphatics, uh, all that stuff in there, the, the living part of the tooth really. And then we'll real quickly, we'll get to what makes up a tooth. Um, most of it, you see the white is your enamel. That's the hardest substance in your body. That's the white part of your tooth that you see. And then what makes up the bulk of the tooth is this dentin. So dentin's not quite as hard. It's still really hard, but uh, it makes up the bulk of the tooth. And then just give you a little preview. I'll put it in green. When the enamel gives out, 
on the roots is something called cementum. And cementum uh, coats the roots when the, once the enamel gives up. This is the enamel cementum junction right there. Yeah. Same anatomy, different tooth, you can see here. Um, different kind of shape to it, a beautiful view. Another name of the gums is your gingiva. So you can see your gingiva <clears throat> adheres tightly onto the bone and to the tooth itself. And we'll see some of the major issues in dentistry is that this little groove here, this little tiny space here is called the sulcus. And you guys know, you should know, remember, sulcus means a groove. And uh, this can, uh, plaque can build up, bacteria can build up, and then the gum will um, be inflamed and pull away from the tooth. And you get recession, where more and more the root is exposed. And if that keeps going unchecked, the tooth will eventually uh, wiggle free and you'll lose the tooth. Look at those little white lines. You guys see those? I'm making them green now. But this is made out of collagen and some elastin fibers too, mostly collagen. But these little fibers are going to anchor the tooth. They go from the cementum to the, the bone of the, um, of, the, of, the, of the bone, of the mandible maxilla. And um, call it the periodontal ligament. So this ligament is a whole bunch of mostly collagen that's going to anchor the tooth. So you try to pull your tooth that's going to stop it from being pulling out. You have all these ligaments along there. Yeah, take a look at it. When you look at this, um, the bony part of it, see the bony part of it? That's the socket, right? The socket that the root goes in there. They are called the alveolar process too. That sounds confusing because remember alveoli were the little sacs in our lung, right? Alveoli means a little socket, a little sac. And so it's the root, it's the socket that the tooth fits in, is the alveolar, um, um, is the alveoli. And then uh, the whole part of your mandible that holds your teeth, it's called the alveolar process. Look at this tooth here. This looks like a canine here. You can see the white enamel, which is beautiful on top. The dentin, that golden color making up most of it. And you see the, the root canal, the pulp cavity is more vertical in this one as opposed to the molar in the last one. Beautiful. And you can see a tooth is a living structure because you can see it has blood vessels and nerves going to it. Uh, you feel your teeth uh, if they're the real teeth. So let's talk enamel. Enamel is in fact harder than bone is the hardest substance in your body is your teeth and specifically the enamel, the whites on the outside. And you spend your life just chewing down on stuff and then testing it, don't you? And the substance is called uh, hydroxyapatite. It's a mouthful. But um, I'll show you the chemi chemistry of that, but it has calcium in it, right? Um, and enamel, <clears throat> look at that, 96 to 98% inorganic salts, crystal, which means 2 to 4% of collagen. That's organic living, well, organic material. And so really hard. It is solid hard as your enamel hardest substance. Got to last your lifetime, right? Of grinding out all the food that you eat. And <clears throat> again, look at that wicked thick on your, on your big molars right there. And where the enamel comes down and uh, begins the root, the enamel gives away to cementum. So the cemento enamel junction. And you can see that on teeth that are receding. You can see where um, the white enamel, and then it's kind of a uh, yellowish cementum. I and mean, you can tell it's just a real sharp delineation right there. Just showing a picture. You can, uh, you can seal your teeth too. You can put this material that fits in the cracks and crevices, because I'll talk about uh, cavities really very soon. Not good, right? <laughs> We're looking at um, some tooth decay. So... It, that is an issue. This shows a little bit of recession too. It's the black is kind of throwing us off, but uh, the enamel will reach this far. There's going to be some exposed cementum, but it's already been eaten away. You can see that. So we don't call them cavities. We call them dental caries. And uh, 
This happens um, when bacteria give off acid as a byproduct, and this acid will eat away at the enamel, this crystal. And it's a slow process, it doesn't happen overnight. But uh, caries really came about, it became a pandemic, which is a word we're hearing a lot of now with COVID. But uh, that means it's a <clears throat> disease state that's found around the world. And it happened really when we switched to, um, to uh, processed sugars. We figured out sugar cane and beets, so we could get sugar. Um, and here in Maine from uh, maple, maple sugar. But these uh, processed sugars really, if we have a diet of those, it really allows the bacteria, they love to feed on that. They will grow and um, um, give off acid and the acid will have these caries. And you don't feel them until they hit a nerve. And so as they make their way through your enamel, and this is where you want to catch them. If you can catch them that small, you can just fill it up. Just fill it up with some um, cement or whatever they do. Um, but once it comes down here, then uh, there's some little nerves going through the dentin. And once it hits a nerve, then you feel sensitivity to cold or heat or uh, just pain. And then uh, at that point, um, uh, you feel it, and then they can still, they, they drill this area out and, and fill it up with a, a artificial material. And if it gets really serious and it's really infected the tooth, you have to do a root canal where they'll, they'll just drill this all out and just fill it up so it's no longer uh, living material there. So that's what uh, caries are. Caries are cavities. <clears throat> and uh, you see fluoride in your... Uh, they put it in the water, and they put it in toothpaste. Uh, you can get a fluoride treatment uh, by your dentist. And it's believed that fluoride, well, we know it binds to the calcium on, on enamel, makes it a little more resistant to the acids. <clears throat> so that's the benefit of uh, fluoride. Um, I talked about fluoride with the pineal gland. There's a whole bunch of people that believe that uh, the fluoride in our water is uh, dangerous and that some yeah, well, I'm not going to repeat conspiracy theories, but uh, um, there's some segment of people that believe that fluoride is not so innocuous and that it shouldn't be just uh, put in our water. Beautiful. And then cavities. Um, again, they used to use gold and they could use amalgams of silver and other metals, and now they have uh, all kinds of epoxies that are tooth colored and uh, a lot of uh, cool innovations. Now, caries, how, how prevalent are they? This is very, very common disease because you can see almost all adults are not going to make it through life without a cavity or cary, right? Um, and this shows um, uh, caries in, in, in children around the world. Below age 12, I believe. Just talk, talk a little bit about it. <clears throat> Um, so the green and the blue means that's good. And then uh, the yellow, the red means lots of uh, caries in these kids. Um, yeah, Bolivia really stands out. And, oh God, it could be Turkey or Estonia or something, something in there. Um, but then the yellow, you look at South America, Mexico, uh, Eastern Europe, and, and including Soviet Union. Um, and then where it's good, you see Western Europe, United States, uh, Australia, really good. China, yeah, really good. And um, a lot of this, of course, has to do with access to dental care. Um, but you may see, you look at Africa, where you know that there's uh, not, especially Central Africa, not a lot of uh, uh, advanced uh, health care, including dentistry. But then it's probably related more to diets when you don't eat processed sugars. In some places where your kids are just given lots of sugar, you're going to have more caries. And, uh, but Access to healthcare and dentistry, uh, very sad. You can see, you know, kids living in poverty have a lot more cavities. Um, could be because they don't have access to, they don't have access to processed cheap foods uh, and also not access to dentists. If you can go regularly every six months and get a cleaning and get a checkup, you can catch those cavities early. And so it's kind of sad. People and, and kids, no fault of their own, born without access to health care, again, not their own fault, um, are going to have a uh, kind of an anchor put on their lives with uh, bad teeth uh, only because of uh, not having access to the dentist. There's the cementum. As I showed you, this shows it more clearly. And a lot of people you can see when you see recession, 
there's actually a saying you guys you want to know an old person saying is that um i'll give you two actually I'll give you two one is um they're long in the tooth that guy is long in the tooth what that means is they're old and uh old people don't grow longer teeth but their gums recede so that looks like they have longer teeth uh cool huh so long in the tooth is because we have this recession throughout life where our gums simply go back and it makes our teeth appear longer and then the other saying would be uh, don't look a gift horse in the mouth and this is when someone gives you a gift don't expect it too much don't inspect it don't question it just take it like accept it as a gift um, and it comes from someone gives you a horse old horses their teeth get worn down worn down and so if someone gives you oh look at this nice horse you bring it home you're like oh jesus it's like almost dead you know because it doesn't have any teeth left it's very old so uh, that's where that saying comes from yeah and elephants I mean, they they uh um, their teeth wear down throughout their whole life and they, they have these huge molars that come forward and old ones will die often of starvation because they've worn all their teeth out and elderly humans too have issues too when, when you lose your teeth uh, you're not able to chew food and um, you know without dentures and things like that <clears throat> it's difficult for the elderly to get enough nutrition without you know without help right, let's talk about cementum here so cementum is um you can see it's 65 percent mineral not 98 percent. so it's much softer and it's this yellowish covering that you see on this tooth and in this live view here you can see you can see the uh cementum showing through if this was a completely healthy person the gum would cover this but here we can see that recession we can see a little bit of cementum and it's not as hard as the enamel by far yeah well, interestingly we can age if you kill a bear i think it's a fisher now here you uh the um uh, dnr will, will take a tooth they'll pull a tooth and they can age the bear like this um because the cementum, um, every year the bear hybridates and then period of growth and not just like a tree. It shows these rings and they can, uh, that's an accurate way to age a bear and some other animals by looking at rings of the teeth. It doesn't work with humans. And interestingly, there's no way to really age a human. I mean, to the year, right? You got birth certificates, but other than that, um, you know, there's, there's no other really absolute way that we can age how many years we've lived this life, like a, unlike a tree. I have a bear skull here, of course, you know, I have a lot of bear skulls, but yes, this is a big one. And looking at the teeth here, you can see they've got impressive canines, <clears throat> very impressive canines. And their molars are a lot like ours. Well, you can see that. But their molars are flat, like ours. Yeah. Just like a, uh, pigs, too. Pigs and, uh, and bears, they're omnivorous, so they eat uh, uh, plants and animals. So they have similar teeth. And then I brought one other skull here looking at this this is a beaver so the beaver has has these uh, really long uh, molars in there and then what's most impressive are the incisors okay, you can see that and the incisors from the side you can see they come together For those of you that are hamsters you know you have to give them a chew toy or their teeth get super long because they need to keep wearing it and the teeth is wedge shaped like this like a knife it's a self-sharpening knife because this this yellow part on the outside is the hard enamel and it's softer on the inside so whenever they bite it keeps making this wedge shape because this outer part stays the hardest and the teeth keeps growing longer and longer and it will keep sharpening itself like that as it goes about its normal eating All right, this periodontal ligament. Um, this is, uh, like I say, these fibers that keep the tooth tethered in the bone so it doesn't fall out. Uh, but it allows movement, it allows a little bit of movement, doesn't it? Um, beautiful. And, and really, those, those ligaments, they go right into the bone and into the cementum. So it's not like it's just um, tied to the outside, you know, just tied to the outside. They go in, in. So it's a really strong connection, that periodontal ligament. And interestingly, you guys remember the disease? Oh, I don't think I've talked about it. I don't think I've talked about it yet. We do it with vitamins. But vitamin C, if you have a deficiency of vitamin C, sailors used to get it because they go off to sea and they wouldn't eat any, any citrus or anything like that. It's called scurvy. Scurvy when you don't get enough vitamin C. 
And uh, one of the effects of that is your teeth fall out. Uh, your skin looks bad, yeah, a lot of problems. But because you don't, you need vitamin C to make collagen. And if you don't make the collagen, you're not making this uh, periodontal ligaments to hold the tooth in. Your teeth will get loose. So the dentin is, uh, it's, this, the, the hardness of teeth goes enamel, dentin, then cementin, then bone. Um, so uh, uh, the dentin makes up the bulk of the tooth. Um, and I love this, you take a look at it here, you can see it's made of these little tubules like this. And you see sometimes that um, dental caries can travel down those tubules and some nerves will come in a little bit. The nerves are in the pulp cavity, but they'll come a little bit into the dentin. So it would be your first indicator that um, something is invading your tooth like that. So the dentin makes up most of your tooth and it continually grows throughout your life. Um, yeah, the enamel, you put it on and then that's it. And then it, it erupts. So the dentin grows from the inside. So that layer of making it's from the inside. And so your dentin will actually get thicker and your pulp cavity will get smaller as you age. Yeah, and that's what I, I say here, yeah. So yeah, when you look at a really old tooth, there's a young tooth, the young tooth has a big pulp cavity and if someone has lived 80, 90 years, it's gonna get smaller because they're laying down the dentin really slowly from the inside. So that pulp cavity, it's connected down at the, the ends of the roots, there'll be a little hole and uh, the, the, um, the root canal will go up the roots and into this pulp cavity. And that's the part that hurts when you know, a carry reaches that part. But it's a living part of the tooth, teeth are living, uh, you're putting on that dentin, blood is flowing in and out of it. Yeah. So these sockets, these alveoli or sockets in your maxilla and your mandible are where the teeth sit. What's interesting, you look at um, babies and old people, they have a similar look to their, their face here. And uh, what happens is that the, the bone really uh, is influenced by the teeth being there and, and by meeting each other and that, that pressure keeps the bone. And once you lose all your teeth, that mandible gets really narrow, just the bone gets reabsorbed. And so you see an old person with no teeth and a, and a baby with no teeth, they have a very narrow mandible. Once the teeth are there, you know, taking the impact of chewing, uh, it keeps the, keeps the bone solid. <clears throat> and in fact, um, why I got an implant is way back here, no one would probably even notice it, um, is that teeth need to, to occlude to each other. They need that pressure when they hit each other. And if you lose a lower tooth, that upper tooth will hyper erupt. It'll keep growing because it has nothing on the other side to hit. So it will actually hyper erupt. It'll take a long time. I probably could have lived with it, but, uh, but no. And <clears throat> the teeth will move depending on their pressures. Uh, if you, if you uh, have a tooth removed, uh, the other teeth will, uh, will come together. And so it's a slow motion process, but uh, teeth respond to uh, pressures on them. Now see, that's how braces or orthodontics work. It's just slow pressure is gonna cause the bone to reabsorb and form and move. These teeth will move all the time. For those of you that didn't wear your retainer, you know uh, teeth can, can go back very easily. It's slow motion, but you know, it's gonna happen. Yeah, orthodontics. Um, I got braces when I was 40 something. It was weird going into orthodontists, all a bunch of little kids with their, what color you know, bands do I want? And I'm this you know, tall guy right there. Um, but you know, uh, my teeth crossed and I wanted them straight and you know, I had good insurance, so yeah, we'll do it. Um, but this, this whole idea, uh, if you be an orthodontist, is you gotta really study physics. You gotta look at where the pressure is and, um, and think ahead where you want those tooth to go, teeth to go. And quite simply, this is a tooth. If you uh, just put pressure on it, well, a different color, you put some pressure on it, um, nothing will happen immediately, but it's going to uh, cause the tooth to press against the bone here. It's gonna press against it. And that causes the bone to erode, to, to move away, to, to, to erode, that's a better word like that. And the tooth will slow over, slowly over time move and then bone will fill in on the other side. And so you can move the teeth, uh, just amazing, right? You just put pressure on with rubber bands and other equipments and you keep that slow, steady pressure 
and it's uh, when you push the tooth against the bone, that bone that's be being pressed against is going to just erode, and you have a slow motion movement, and then bone will fill on the other side. So you can move your teeth around with orthodontics or Invisalign, all the kinds of things that that uh, um, put slow, steady pressure on. So it's a huge business and uh, and uh, pretty cool. All right, your gingiva or your gums. Um, this uh, you want them to be tight against your tooth. There's going to be a sulcus or a little groove. This is the sulcus, and you want that to be as small as possible. And if you get a good dental checkup, they'll stick a, a needle in there and they'll test how deep they are, and they can record it and over years see if things are changing. Um, because uh, if you get uh, bacteria growing in there, again, like I say, the gums will be irritated, they'll move away, and then the bone will start eroding, and you'll have recession where the gums come away, you're starting to see the tooth is exposed, and you keep going, so there's less there's less and less of a, um, a socket, and the tooth that you'll eventually lose that tooth. And plaque is uh, a bunch of uh, uh, bacteria and, and other material that gets hard and solid, and they need to scrape that away. There's a cool, nice picture. You guys should be able to take a look at this, be able to read these things, right? The enamel is the, the white. You can see it's the most dense substance. You see it on top of all these, these teeth. Oh, damn. That's going to be, see, that's the third molar, a wisdom tooth. Not coming in quite right, is it? So you guys know this is molar one, two, and three. And so this is going to be premolar one and two, right? And then you can see in here beautifully, you can see uh, the outline of the pulp cavity. And so you should all know that this is your dentin, right? The yellow is your dentin. Oh, enamel. I'll do enamel. I'll do it in red. So you can see the enamels right here. Yeah. And then cementum is going to cone all this up to here, yeah. wherever, the, wherever the enamel stops. Let's see enamel stopping. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And look at how deep. Look at how deep those, those roots are. Uh, especially on those molars. Wow, it won't come out easily. So I'm showing you here another view. You're looking at someone that grinds the teeth, which could cause the TMJ, but it's also not good for your teeth. And you see that exposed dentin, don't you? Yeah. So the enamel, you can see it around there, the white has been worn away by excessive grinding. So you see the dentin, oh, yeah. And the dentin's softer. And again, remember, there's those kind of tubes. So you're kind of got it, you're getting close to getting to that pulp cavity. And so you need to, to fix that. And again, not human, but you look at, you find a deer skull, a, a horse or a cow, or anything like that. And you see these ridges like this. And so that's great for grinding your food if you're eating, um, twigs and things that are very fibrous need to be ground, right? And all that is, is these layers of enamel and dentin purposely, and the dentin is softer, so that wears away and it leaves these enamel um, shelves coming out. And so you get this nice grinding surface. As you wear the tooth away, you're going to have the enamel will stay tall and the dentin will erode in between it, and you end up with this great grinding surface like that. So you'll hear periodontal disease, uh, perimeter of your tooth disease, and that's where you'll have this uh, uh, recession of the gums away from the tooth. Oh, and you can see beautifully illustrated here, you see the gums pulling away. Look at the redness of the gums, that they're inflamed. There's probably, there's probably bacteria in there that's, that's causing that. Yep, and your socket will get less and less and less. And they can do things like do a bone graft. They can put some bone in here and to, to make the socket deeper if they need to. And they can also uh, move the gum, take, move the gum, I forgot what it's called, but they can move the gum over that res recess, recessive area. All right, so we've talked about the teeth, a lot about the teeth, my goodness, yes. Um, important structures. All right, hopefully you guys understand the anatomy of the teeth and uh, what they're made out of and some, some issues too. All right, let's talk saliva, spit. So you have three 
pairs of salivary glands, I want you to know. The big ones are right here. In front of your ear, a little bit below. Then you, I, I, can, I know it's here. In, inside here, you're going to have, I mean, this is my masseter muscle for chewing. It's on top of it in front of my ear. And I feel these when I uh, bite into a lemon or something sour. It might be pain right here. You might feel that. There's a big bunch of glands right here. It's my parotid glands. And there's a duct that runs over my masseter and comes above my second molar. The duct empties out. So spit will come, most of the spit comes out up there. Then I have a pair of salivary glands down here, submandibular, below the mandible. And then two little ones underneath my tongue, sublingual. There you go, three pairs of salivary glands. We'll talk more about them. And just as an interest too, venomous snakes, you know, the venom and cobras and rattlesnakes like I'm holding here, um, is modified saliva. So their salivary glands make a bunch of enzymes, and then they evolved, they, they made ones that had chemicals that affected blood clotting and blood pressure, so that um, when a rattlesnake bites, the salivary glands have a duct that goes out on that syringe-like fang into the mouse, and the mouse sometimes can only run like, you know, a few yards, well, a few, 10 yards usually, and then it just collapses because that uh, chemicals have screwed up its blood pressure and it's clotting and it just just kills it like that and the rattlesnake leisurely follows it and, uh, and swallows it so our salivary glands make a whole bunch of saliva and the saliva empties into our mouth and so you all know that saliva is going to moisten our food make it into this bolus that we can push back and then swallow right and it's modified, uh, these are glands, they become more and more complex, branching, branching, so they can make a lot of products. So the most digestive juices you make are come from your salivary glands. Think how much spit you produce. You, you can't even think about it, because you don't know, because you swallow it all the time. Um, so let's talk about the product glands. So you can see how big they are. See this picture right in front of your ear? And then that duct um, is gonna is going to loop it's going to go above your second molar on the outside on the uh, buccal side sometimes you can feel a little bump there if it's been inflamed some people can but after where most of the fluid comes out it's pouring in on either side above your second molar into your mouth it is a watery fluid we're talking about serous mostly watery and you all need to know the enzyme you produce is salivary amylase and amylase di digests starches, carbohydrates. So you begin starch digestion with your spit. And mumps is a viral infection. We don't see that too much because you get vaccinated for it, right? I hope, hope so. Submandibular, you have two glands on either side and they have ducts that come up and empty under your tongue on either side. You can see those too. Um, and this one is serous, but then we got some mucus. Those are our two choices. Serous is watery with enzymes, and then mucus is stringy, mucusy, lubricating. And the most mucus-like are the ones under our tongue. They're small, they have lots of little ducts that empty underneath your tongue into your mouth. And when I look at the histology, see how clear it is? These cells, they look very clear. It means they're making uh, lipids, because remember, well, lipids are going to be washed away with the organic solvents that make these slides. So goblet cells look clear, these look clear. So it's a clue that it's making a fatty substance as opposed to the parotid gland, it was more dark purple. It's making more enzymes, proteins. Ah, oh, here's a cool trick. I can't do it on cue, but uh, sometimes it just happens. Gleeking is when you can have a uh, the fluid from your submandibular glands will come out the two ducts underneath your tongue. Some trivia for you. So look how much spit you make. Oh my God. That's about how much some people drink, right? Um, yeah, in a day. Don't no, more than a couple liters. You know, it depends on some of you guys are very hydrated. But um, you don't lose this water because the spit goes down your... Uh, you swallow it and it gets reabsorbed, right, before it comes out. So you can make, you can afford to use all this water because you can reabsorb it. But this is what comes into our mouth. Um, during the day, you make a lot more. You make a whole lot more when you're eating, right? And then uh, when you're sleeping, you make less, but you're still producing spit all the time. 
Um, one of the things about this is that if you don't produce spit, um, and methamphetamine apparently does this, slows your salivary production, is that spit has um, um, bicarbonate ions that are basic, and they will help neutralize the acid that's being produced by the bacteria in your mouth. And bacteria live in your mouth all the time. And it's interesting, we have these two communities, the nighttime and the daytime shift. So you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you have the daytime group, it's aerobic, you're talking, you're eating, right? Then at night you sit there and those bacteria are overwhelmed by these anaerobic bacteria at night. And um, they produce more sulfur compounds, so you have really bad breath in the morning. And so you live, bacteria reproduce so rapidly that you have this kind of day shift and night shift in the bacteria in your mouth. And if you have a problem making saliva, you're going to have cavities like crazy because the uh, that saliva was neutralizing or buffering that acidity. Yeah. And um, in terms of producing it, you're going to see, even when you think about food, right, uh, your mouth starts watering, even before you, if you smell it or right, before you eat it. And they start eating, you produce a lot of saliva. But you can even predict that and start making saliva. And it's going to be your parasympathetic is... Uh, is digesting, right? And sympathetic, if you're fight or flight, your mouth gets dry, it's kind of like sticky, because you make you don't make as much of that watery fluid you would if you're digesting. All right, so saliva is gonna start digestion of starch with amylase, it's called salivary amylase. It's gonna buffer any acidity to help uh, control the bacteria. And you can't taste anything unless it's dissolved in water. And so uh, saliva is going to uh, wetten the food on your tongue so that the taste buds can work. All right. Well, just going um, <clears> to <throat> quickly go through kind of the layers on the tube. And then uh, it's been 47 minutes. I hope you guys take a, you can pause it, right? Yeah. Um, we'll talk about that. And then the next lecture we'll get into uh esophagus and the stomach and the intestines, things like that. But let's get overview of the whole thing. Your alimentary canal, mouth to anus, and it's freaking eight meters long, right? You guys are just like two meters tall, some of you a lot less than that. Um, yeah, how's it all fit in there? Well, it's a long coil tube. Uh, most of it is going to be your small intestines, like six meters of it, so most of it. Small intestines are just like a bunch of linguine all stuck in your in your abdomen. So it's how it's all folded around. Very cool. And this too, as I as I, I mentioned, if you study uh, the most primitive jawless fish, the lamprey, that's what their stomach looks like. Their their elementary canal. <laughs> food comes in, then food goes out, right? And then as you get to a simple fish like this, oh, it's got to bend. And then the intestines has this kind of like spiral thing to slow things down a little bit. And stomach, it's kind of expanded a little, but you can see very, very simple. And uh, we get to, uh, here's a nice striper. You can see, oh, now the stomach's a little more defined, isn't it, right? You got a little more of a stomach so it kind of hold food. And then you can see the intestines get longer. When you look at an amphibian, now we can kind of see a small and a large intestine. So these have kind of separated out a little bit more, right? And the stomach is, is very defined. And you get to us, birds and mammals. Uh, and we have a lot of separation where the stomach is obvious from the esophagus to that. And the intestines, large and small, look very different. <clears throat> now remember birds, they, um, they can have this uh, crop where it comes off the esophagus. They can... A partridge can eat a bunch of grain or a turkey and then go and fill up their crop with the seeds and then as they're up safe in a tree they empty that little sack and it's going to go down and they can also have a gizzard which is a muscular part of their stomach that they, they um, birds will eat gravel and uh, and they will um, use that because they don't have teeth to kind of grind the grain there too so yeah, all kinds of comparative anatomy we can get to but the mammalian digestive system is long a lot of surface area. It's really made because we are expensive. We need calories. We got to get everything out of it quick. 
an alligator, a snake can have six months to digest a meal, but we've got to move the food through. We've got to get lots of uh, calories out. So we chew the hell out of it, and then we, our digestive system has lots of surface area to get all those nutrients. All right, looking at the gut tube, it has, it's the same throughout, all the way down, but uh, there's modifications. And the layers um, include the inner layers, the mucosa. And it includes the epithelium with the cells. And if it was the intestine, it'd be columnar cells, goblet cells in there too. And um, <clears throat> there's even a little muscular layer. It's a little bit of smooth muscle in the mucosa. Now, it's simply going to like move the mucosa a little bit. The muscular layer on the outside is going to cause, you know, the big movements in the intestine. But the mucosa has a little, little wisps of smooth muscle around it. So there can be some movement of the mucosa too. The submucosa is going to be beneath that. It's going to be a bunch of connective tissue and blood vessels, and uh, there can be a bunch of glands in that submucosa. You can see here's an example of a gland that's going to empty out into the middle. And the middle of the tube, whether it's your stomach or intestines, is the lumen. Right? The lumen is the, the middle. And then the muscular layer. You're going to see your whole gut tube has to keep things moving in, in one direction, and uh, unless you're vomiting, but moving things in one direction usually. And uh, you've got a layer of uh, circular muscle that goes around and a layer of longitudinal muscle that goes up and down the whole uh, tube. And these two allow you to squeeze and shorten the intestine in order to move things around or, or, or in case your stomach to kind of crush the food by moving like that. Yeah, it's smooth muscle, you don't, so you don't control it. And the serosa is the connective tissue on the outside. And we're looking at a piece of esophagus, and you can see the lumen is the white in the middle. You see the mucosa, that, that dark purple, and then you can see the submucosa layer, right? It's right here, before you get to the muscle. Yeah, do you remember what kind of epithelium is gonna lie in the esophagus? Stratified squamous, non-keratinized. So that mucosal layer, <clears throat> the, the muscular layer will, will, will vary. Your submucosa will vary. Some will have glands, some won't. But that mucosa is the inner layer, inner layer that, that's going to vary the most. And it is the, that's the freaking barrier between everything you put in your mouth and down you, you swallow and your body, right? And if something's in there that you can't digest, it's going to go all the way through you, right? But you want to keep your large intestine, tons of bacteria, you want to keep that separate from your body. So it's going to be an important barrier. And a lot of it is going to uh, be secreting out a bunch of enzymes and fluids will be coming out. And uh, the mucosa layer in your small intestine is going to be where you're going to absorb the water, the vitamins, the nutrients. So those cells are wicked important. And then to remind you, I told you the esophagus has stratified squamous because as you swallow something, um, your stomach will pulverize it and make it into kind of a milkshake. But before then, you could scratch on your way down. So um, the stratified squamous allows you to, to lose layers of that epithelium. The surface area is just amazing. I told you the lung surface area, then the kidney surface area. That's what it's all about. Surface area, more surface area, the greater the diffusion that can happen. And when we look at, for instance, the small intestine, which would be had the most surface area, it's gonna have these folds, looks like this. And if you look at a cadaver, if you look at the uh, intestine, you open it up, it looks like velvet. Because on it is gonna be these little fingers, these little villi. And then microscopically, there's microvilli on the villi. So it's just these layers of surface area. Much like if you wanted to dry yourself out, would you want to use a sheet or a plush towel with all these little fingers of fabric? The plush towel is going to absorb a lot more water because that's more surface area. So by the time that food gets to your small intestine, it's just exposed to this huge surface area so you can absorb things into your body. And then Again, you shoot out all this fluid, gets shot out, starting with saliva. 
want to have liters of saliva every day coming out. Um, and then all the way down, you're going to see mucus in your esophagus. Your stomach has gastric juice with acids and water and everything coming out. So all the way down, you're secreting a whole bunch of fluid into your gut tube. And you absorb most of it before you defecate out. But you, So you can afford to use a bunch of water because then you absorb it on the other end. But mucus, all the way down to move things along, to lubricate, to keep things moving along, definitely. And then other uh, secretory things will be uh, enzymes to break down proteins and fats and carbs. Your stomach, you're going to secrete acid. Um, a lot of your gut too, we're talking about your hunger and your stomach. Hormones are going to come out to influence that, definitely. And then throughout your whole gut tube is a lot of lymphatic tissue because it's a great place for bad guys to get in, either things that you swallow or all the bacteria in your large intestine too. So there's a lot of lymphatic tissue lining your gut. And some glands are single cell, like this goblet cell. And then some are much larger, like submucosal glands. You look in your um, duodenum, there's these huge glands that are secreting fluid that's going to hit that um, chyme, this like milkshake that comes out of your stomach a whole bunch of uh, big glands, submucosal glands. And then, of course, huge things like your liver and pancreas that are extensions off of uh, your gut tube. Show an example. Here's some whole bunch of glands in the submucosa. You guys recognize where we're at here? What kind of epithelium is this? That'd be stratified squamous. So we must be looking at esophagus here too. And all these glands here, they're eventually going to have a duct that comes out. So it'll keep mucus coming out so you can, uh, your food is lubricated as you swallow it down. Submucosa, I mean, it's an, it's an area with connective tissue and fat and blood vessels and lymphatics and nerves. It's just the space between the mucosa and the muscular. And this is the big muscular layer. So you can see this is, I know this is in the ilium, your small intestine. Um, we're looking here, these little things are these little fingers. They're going to the villi that are coming out that are cut like that. Oh. And then the submucosal layer has these huge things that we call pyre patches in the business. These are all uh, lymphocytes, B cells and T cells. And this muscular layer, I believe this is, this is wrong. I don't believe that's the serosa. This muscular layer here is smooth muscle. And this is going to be the circular layer like this. And this will be the longitudinal layer coming out at you at the screen. And so we're missing a serosa on the outside of that. All right, so looking at the intestines, you guys got uh, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, serosa. And these muscles, they look like smooth and longitudinal if you just take a, a snapshot, just like a section through it. But in reality, if we, we took a longer, a whole series, we'd see it actually is, that longitudinal layer is actually slowly spiraling. Just a little extra. Just like we said in the, in the heart, that the ventricles, it looks like it just contracts like this, but it actually kind of twists like that so that they do slowly spiral. And you always have a, an inner circular layer, which is gonna decrease the lumen, and the outer longitudinal layer, which will shorten the whole intestine like that. And we'll see in the stomach, we kind of have an additional, like one at an angle that helps kind of, your stomach really kind of crushes things. All right, so here's a little helpful chart from your book. Now the tube, this is under autonomic control. So you don't say, okay, intestines, go, right? It's completely done by your autonomic nervous system. And don't forget, sympathetic is fight or flight. So that is going to slow down your whole um, gut tube, gut functioning, right? That's why you don't swim after you eat, because uh, if you're exercising, that sympathetic nervous system is going to increase your heartbeat and everything like that. And it's going to work against the parasympathetic, which you need to digest. You could get a tummy ache. Um, looking at the innervation of the gut tube, um, you're going to have a whole bunch of nerves here in the submucosa and they control really the uh, secretion and the activity in the mucosa what's going on there and then the myenteric means muscle that's going to be out here it's another layer with lots of nerve cells and that's going to control the the muscular movement of the tube 
how motile it is, how much it moves. And so after a big meal, you can hear your stomach, well, before a big meal, you can hear your stomach grumbling. And then after you can kind of hear, you can hear intestinal noises if you put a stethoscope up. So a lot of motility uh, when it's working on food. And again, vagus nerve, parasympathetic, increases gut activity. Sympathetic, fight or flight, decreases gut activity generally. Of course, you need some histology, right? Just showing you, see these big old purple cells? Those are neurons. Remember, histology, neurons, big purple cells like that. So I was just showing here, that's the myoteric plexus within this muscular layer here. And you all recognize the smooth muscle? I hope so. So these muscles are going to, you need to move the food. I mean, you take it in your mouth, you chew it, then you swallow it, then it's on its way down those eight meters, right? So it needs to be moved along. And also along the way, your gut tube has to crush it, to mix it, to, to do that, especially your stomach, but intestines too. You want to mix it, wash the enzymes over it to really break up chemically all the food that you eat. I think you know the word peristalsis is just this movement down the tube. So it's going to keep the food moving in, in one direction. And looking at this tube at the very beginning and the end, you do have skeletal muscle, right? Looking at your bucan, uh, no, uh, ubicularis oris, the muscles <clears throat> in your throat are actually skeletal muscles. And the other end, your external anal sphincter is skeletal muscle too. But everything in between is smooth muscle. So you, you control the beginning and end, but not the middle. And we get to the stomach, we'll talk again about a third layer of muscle unique to the stomach. It's not super impressive when you see it, but it does have an oblique or a, uh, muscle layer at an angle that helps really churn your food in your stomach. I think we're going to end on sphincters. So a sphincter is um, muscle that's going to make um, a door. I say a door, yeah, like a, a sphincter. It's going to make it, it's going to close or open. It's a thickening of the muscle in certain parts of your body to keep things um, open or closed. And so we'll talk about something you need to know. One thing is looking at the esophagus. And so you have an upper and a lower esophageal sphincter. And the upper esophageal sphincter is kept closed all the time as you're breathing. Only when you swallow does it relax to allow the food to go down your pharynx and then start its way down your esophagus. And then the lower esophageal sphincter, that's kept closed too, because you don't want stomach contents to go up your esophagus. So that opens up as the food comes down the esophagus and allows it to dump in the stomach, then it shuts closed again, closed again. Yeah, and we'll see, we also call this lower esophageal sphincter the cardiac sphincter, because it's kind of right below your heart. So heart burns when you feel digestive juices that are coming up and eroding the esophagus, which isn't protected as much as your stomach. So stomach acid coming up will cause heartburn. It's not your heart. It's uh, right below your heart. That's what it feels like it could be your heart. An impressive sphincter is the pyloric sphincter. And that is what we see at the other end of the stomach, right here. Pylorus was a gatekeeper of hell. Uh, and uh, this is the, the hell of your intestines. It's, it's the gatekeeper right there. And uh, as food comes into your stomach, it washes back and forth, sometimes for hours, well, usually three, four hours back and stomach. And then your pyloric sphincter is kept closed while that food gets pummeled and digested. And then the pyloric sphincter will relax itself to squirt out a little bit of juice into your intestines at a time. So that's what the pyloric sphincter does. You can be, uh, sometimes babies or adults will have stenosis or it's too narrow, and so the baby is throwing up all the time, but the food won't go down, so they have to go in there and open that up. So the small intestines, I haven't talked about it yet. The end of the small intestine is where it empties into the large intestine. And we're gonna call the first part of this large intestine the cecum. And then the last part of the small intestine is the ileum. Again, this is new if you haven't had it before. So ileocecal valve is the valve between the ileum and the cecum. So you want the food to go in one direction. You don't want food to go from your colon, the large intestine, back up to your small intestine. So it's just actually kind of a flap of skin that kind of keeps things moving in one direction. You notice the opening to your uh, appendix here too. 
And finally, at your, your anal end, um, the muscle, if you take a look, I'll do it in red. We're looking at, this is the wall of your large intestine, also called colon. And as it comes down, it's going to get thickened here and here. So that's going to be your internal anal sphincter. And that's kept closed, and it keeps uh, the waist will back up behind it. Now, um, a reflex will relax that, but you control this once you're not a baby because the external anal sphincter here comes from skeletal muscle. So that's part of this, your pelvic floor. You've got this muscle that thickens around your anus, and so you control that. So uh, when this rectum gets full, it's going to stretch and that internal sphincter will relax. But as long as you can control that external sphincter, you control if it's open or not. We'll talk more about that. The outer layer is called the serosa. And uh, when we look at the guts, all the guts, like for instance, your, um, your intestines and your stomach, they're lined by this shiny saran wrap. It's a serous layer, so it secretes a little bit of lubricating fluid. So I'm looking at this fresh intestine, I see how shiny it is? It's got a, a coating on it, that's the serosa. And we call it in your abdominal cavity, the visceral peritoneum, all right? The parietal peritoneum lines the cavity, visceral is on the organs, just like the heart, just like the lungs, right? visceral gut probably on the outside and if you look at the intestines we call all this um it has a bunch of fat on it see that we call those the mesenteries so the mesenteries are going to be a sheet of connective tissue it's a double layered sheet actually and in between you'll have uh, blood vessels here's arteries and, and veins and uh, nerves will go down there and even lymphatics yeah and so you know here's the actual gut Oh yeah, yeah. So the gut is held by this mesenteries, as you can see the picture, and they all go to your to your vertebrae in the back and they hang down. Now we stand upright, but if we were like a dog, they would all be hanging down, all of our guts, right? Ours sag down like that. But these mesenteries are, most importantly, this blood comes here, goes around the capillary beds, and the veins are gonna take back all the products of absorption, all your sugars and water and vitamins. Picture here. Uh, yeah, and so if you look at it overall, you can see your guts, like your intestines, they're attached to the back wall by this mesentery. And within it runs the blood vessels. And so the membrane around it is going to be your visceral uh, peritoneum, and it's continuous with this parietal peritoneum that lines the cavity. And these two wet membranes allow your guts to move by each other smoothly because they're lubricated. So you guys, do you get it? The mesenteries, that's how your intestines are all, what they're attached to. They're attached to the back, your spine back there, and they hang down, and in the mesentery uh, runs all the blood vessels and everything else that goes to it. Uh, one particular mesentery uh, that hangs off your stomach and over your intestines is called the greater omentum. It's a fatty, double-layered mesentery that hangs off your stomach like that, and it's filled with fat. Um, it's got some cool things about it that if you have an infection, it can actually kind of go and wall that part off. Uh, yeah, that's a real obvious thing when you open up a body. You see this fatty apron that hangs off your stomach over all of your intestines. All right, an hour. Hopefully you guys took breaks. I think I'm ready for a break now. Yeah, call it a night. Um, it's a beautiful sculpture of a colon. I think it's in the Netherlands or something. Um, so how far have we gotten today? Uh, hopefully uh, you saw the teeth, salivary glands, basics of um, this gut tube, right? Now we got time to go in detail. We'll get to swallowing, we'll get to the esophagus, we'll get to the stomach, intestines. And then we'll talk about the chemical digestion, how enzymes are going to break down everything that you eat. Um, yeah, I'm excited about it. It's good, good stuff. All right. Thanks for hanging in there. If you guys got any questions, you just email me. All right.